Hi, just a reminder that if you enjoy this podcast and want to help it grow and keep going, then it would be greatly appreciated if you could leave a like or a comment or a rating or a subscribe on whatever platform you use. We also have a Patreon, and if you're willing and able to give $3, $5, $10 a month, you'll get various things in return, and it will be greatly appreciated no matter how much it is and no matter how long you can do it for. Anything at all helps to keep this going and helps to keep it free. And speaking of Patreon, I actually have some patrons to thank. So, sincerely, thank you to Ramon Rodriguez and Patricia Scott. Your support is very much appreciated. What? I'm your host, Tom Kearns, and welcome to the Anglo-Saxon England podcast. Episode 21, Athelbald the State Builder. Last time, we ended with the death of King Chaelred, grandson of Penda, who died ignominiously at a feast and left behind a legacy that is pretty overwhelmingly negative. Following Chaelred's death in 716, the kingship of Mercia passed into the hands of the new dynasty. And with this new dynasty, there came new dynamism. In this episode, we'll be looking at the first member of this new dynasty, King Athelbald, who I've called the State Builder. Why? Well, it's because, as I will show, Athelbald in several ways oversaw the development of Mercia from a loose overlordship to something approximating a state with a nascent hierarchy and bureaucracy. In this episode, first we'll look at his family and his early life, and then we'll consider the various ways that he revolutionised Mercian politics. Finally, we will wrap it up with a brief consideration of his legacy. Not very much is known about Athelbald's family. In The Life of Guthlac by Felix, he's said to have been a descendant of Eowa, Penda's mysterious older brother. His father, we're told, was named Alweo, and he apparently had a brother named Heobert, who served as an elderman under him once he became king. Obviously, if they were descendants of Eowa, then this makes his family a branch of the same dynasty as Penda's. But other than that, we really don't know very much about his background. We do know, though, that he was considered enough of a political danger to be sent into exile by Chaelred, possibly an indication of strife between the two branches of the family. It was while in exile that Athelbald seems to have lived an itinerant life in East Anglia. The only thing we know he did during his exile was to visit St. Guthlac, a Mercian noble who'd taken up the life of a hermit in a burial mound in the East Anglian Fens. The record of Athelbald's visit to the saint, along with his band of companions, is recorded in the life of Guthlac written by Felix and it contains a lot of the usual hagiographic tropes of Guthlac miraculously healing companions from diseases and that kind of thing. What is most interesting in Felix's account, though, is that it seems to suggest Guthlac was tied closely to Athelbald to political success, as is seen in the episode of a dream attributed to Athelbald following the saint's death. In this dream, Guthlac appeared to Athelbald and prophesied that he would become a great king, and overthrow his enemies. Obviously, with the death of Chaelred in 716, this prophecy was fulfilled, and Athelbald seems to have returned from exile and claimed the Mercian throne, although if he claimed it through violence or if he was welcomed back isn't recorded in any of the documents. As a way of recognising the devotion he had to Guthlac, Athelbald then played a very key role in supporting the early cult of the saint at the Abbey of Crowland, Thus, Athelbald emerges from a fairly mysterious background to become king in 716. The line of Penda then completely lost control of the throne, and it passed instead to the descendants of Eowa. But what world did the new king of Mercia find himself in? 
Well, the England south of the Humber that Athelbald faced in 716 was not a promising one for a new king looking to maintain his rule through the traditional means of warfare. Wessex and Kent were both at that time ruled by very strong kings, Einar and Whitred respectively. These two kings had both been major hindrances to Chaelred's desires to maintain mercy and power, and it looked like they would be a similar hindrance to Athelbald. But in 725, Whitred died, leaving Kent divided between his three sons, and that went about as well as you can probably imagine. And the next year, in 726, Einar abdicated the throne and travelled to Rome to become a monk. Thus, the two biggest obstacles to the expansion of mercy and power were removed, and this left the field open for Athelbald to pursue his policies. But what had Athelbald been doing in the decade between 716 and 726? Well, he seems to have focused mainly on securing his position within Mercia. Obviously, he was more than familiar with the political ramifications of dynastic strife, and he wasn't going to allow those tensions to undermine his authority. So he began stuffing positions of power with friends and kinsmen, most of whom had been with him during his years of exile. One such man was a friend named Ubba, who became a long-serving member of Athelbald's royal household. Likewise, his brother Herbert was appointed as the highest-ranking member of his household during this decade. Given the intensely personal nature of royal power during the Anglo-Saxon period, this, what seems to us like blatant nepotism, was actually a politically savvy move. It meant that Athelbald was surrounded by men who not only were loyal to him from his years in exile, but who owed their positions to him, thus meaning that they were bound to be loyal to him. This way he could be certain of having a base of support around him that would help to neutralise any machinations or plots pursued by any disaffected nobles. With his position at home secured, Athelbald was primed and ready to take advantage of the power vacuum which opened up in Kent and Wessex in 725 and 726 respectively. Of the two, Wessex had long been the greater hindrance to mercy and power, so it was to Wessex that Athelbald first turned his attention. He seems to have first supported the claim to the vacant throne made by a young West Saxon nobleman named Athelherd. This Athelherd is of a disputed ancestry. Possibly he was Einar's brother-in-law, but that is uncertain. What is clear is that the man he challenged, named Oswald, probably had a better claim to the throne than he did, since he was seemingly a member of the royal family. In the end, though, Athelherd succeeded in becoming king, but possibly at the expense of some kind of subordinate relationship to Athelbald. In Kent, although there are no clear signs of Mercian overlordship, during Athelbald's reign, there was a clear trend for Mercian bishops to become the Archbishop of Canterbury, a fact that is sometimes taken as an indicator of Mercia's effective control in the region. With the sons of Whitred more interested in fighting among themselves than in resisting any Mercian advances, it seems that Athelbald was mostly content to leave them to deal with their own problems, rather than forcibly subjugate them. With Wessex and Kent out of the way, Athelbald seems to have undertaken a great consolidation of Mercian control over smaller Midlands kingdoms and key economic areas. In the charters issued by Athelbald, and he issued a lot of charters, comparatively anyway, one of the most striking features we find is the deliberate subordination of kings of realms like the Witcher and the Magosatna. Under kings like Wulfhera, these rulers had still been given the rank and honours of kings, under Athelbald, and even more so under his successor Offa, they were deliberately demoted, until finally they were reduced to the rank of companions to the Mercian king and elderman. The difference between how Athelbald and Wulfhera treated them is subtle, but it's a difference of where a local ruler's authority came from. Under Wulfhera, these men still had royal authority of their own, even if they required the consent of the Mercian king to exercise it by, say, granting land. Under Athelbald and later Offa, these men lost any royal authority, and instead derived all of their authority from the Mercian king. Their realms, in other words, had been fully incorporated into the Mercian kingdom, and no longer had any means of reasserting their independence. Athelbald also reasserted Mercian control of Droitwich and London. 
he clearly took a keen interest in both places, since he issued several charters relating to the economic exploitation of these sites. In London especially, he was keen to promote international trade by waiving tolls on shipping. His interest in economics is also reflected by his minting the first identifiable Mercian coins. There were two mints operating in Mercian territory around the year 731, one in London and one possibly in Oxford, both of which were minting silver coins bearing identical decorations. On one side was the figure of a man wearing a helmet, the traditional headdress of Anglo-Saxon kings, and carrying two crosses. On the other side was a stylized bird and a tree branch, sometimes interpreted as the dove from the Noah story, serving here as a symbol of peace. Nothing on the coins identifies them as Athelbalds, but the date and location of their production seems to suggest that he was the king who produced them. It's also worth noting that their distribution seems to have been mainly around London, suggesting that they were used more for international trade than as an internal Mercian currency. This, if it is the case, would strongly indicate that Athelbald had a keen interest in the economic prosperity of the kingdom, and that he saw London especially as key to that prosperity, and undertook all that he could to ensure that trade there was attractive and could take place as easily as possible. Athelbald's actions as king can be best understood as reflecting two main motives. The incorporation of traditional tributaries into the Mercian kingdom as vassals, and the defence of Mercian territorial and economic interests. Thus, war was not the primary tool of overlordship that it was for Penda and Wolfhera. Certainly, Athelbald engaged in his fair share of wars, and apparently he engaged in it quite successfully. He fought several wars against Wessex, at least one against the Britons, and led at least one raid into Northumbria. But diplomacy seems to have been a more important tool for him than for previous Mercian kings. It's not clear, for example, that he fought with the East Anglians, the people of Essex, or the people of Sussex. They certainly seem to have acknowledged his seniority, but he mostly left them alone, and it's not clear if they were subjected to him in any way. Even Wessex, where he may have played a key role in establishing Athelherod on the throne, was not a subject kingdom to him, and he certainly fought several wars both with Athelherd and with Athelherd's successor, Cuthred. Athelbald seems to have limited his ambitions for direct rule and clear overlordship to a corridor extending from the expanded Mercian heartlands to London. It can seem a bit surprising then, when in 731, Bede, surveying the state of England in the final chapter of his ecclesiastical history, described Athelbald as the ruler of all the southern English, even more so when he's described in the Ismere Charter produced at Worcester in 736 as the King of Britain and the ruler of all southern England. In fact, Athelbald's authority over the other kingdoms was more informal than this suggests. He was without doubt the most powerful king of his day, but that power was more apparent economically than militarily. Another key area in which Athelbald developed the Mercian state was through his relationships with the church, and the implications this had for the workings of Mercian land tenure. St Boniface, a leading English missionary in Germany, wrote a letter to Athelbald in 746, in which he castigated the king for his personal immorality and his mistreatment of the church. Specifically, the saint claimed that Athelbald was taking advantage of nuns rather than getting married. As a side note, it is indeed true that Athelbald doesn't seem to have ever gotten married, and that he was violating the privileges of churches and monasteries by taking revenues from them and placing onerous burdens on them. It is the second claim that is important here. The logic of traditional land grants was that land would be given to loyal followers in return for their service. It was essentially a development of the gift economy of treasure exchange we see in heroic literature like Beowulf. Land had the benefit of providing not just for an individual, but also for his family, thus securing the loyalty of future generations. But by Athelbald's day, the amount of available land was probably becoming limited. So it was not uncommon for kings and nobles to take land from the church. 
Church land was also exempted from taxes and obligations, such as military service, a fact which made it appealing to nobles who wanted land without any of the attached obligations, a state of affairs that Bede claimed was rife in Northumbria in the 710s. This posed a problem for the kings, since it undermined the functioning of the social hierarchy. In response to Boniface's censure, Athelbald convened two councils. The first was held at a place called Cloverso, we are still not 100% sure where Cloverso was, in the year 747, and this served to set out exactly the standards expected from the church in terms of duties and proper behaviour. Two years later, another meeting was held, this time at Gumley, and here a charter was issued establishing that ecclesiastical lands were free from all obligations except those of building bridges and fortifications. Obligations, which this charter affirmed, apply to all land granted by the king. Probably this didn't satisfy Boniface, who in most likelihood wanted church lands to be exempted from all obligations, but it was an important development in Anglo-Saxon government, because it established in writing for the first time specific universal obligations on subjects. In this way, it could be argued that this development definitively changed the relationship between a king and the people to whom he granted land, from being one of a king and warrior companions to one of a king and subject. And this new king-subject relationship was to be defined through written law rather than through unwritten custom. Athelbald was, in many ways, a strikingly modern ruler. Under him, Mercia seems to have experienced what I can only really describe as a period of state-building, he employed the bureaucratic power available to him to permanently expand the Mercian heartlands. He sought to maximise profits from the major Mercian hubs of London and Droitwich, even going so far as to mint Mercia's first silver coinage. And he formally defined the obligations expected of landholders, effectively taking the Mercian kingdom from a realm based on militaristic relationships of loyalty to one based on a king-subject relationship that would be further expanded under offer. In fact, in many ways, Athelbold walked so Offa could run, and we'll see this in the next episode. But none of this could ultimately save Athelbold. In 757, he was murdered in an apparent coup by members of his own household. The tight bonds of friendship that he had established between 716 and 726 seemingly broke down as his reign lasted longer and longer, until finally he was as vulnerable as any other king. Let's not forget, though, that 41 years was an extraordinarily long reign for the Anglo-Saxon period, and despite its conclusion, it is a testament to Athelbald's power and skill as a leader that he could maintain a hold on Mercia for that long. Athelbald was succeeded by a distant relative named Beornred, but his reign was extremely short. Within a year, he was deposed by Athelbald's cousin, twice removed, named Offa. And it was this offer under whom Mercia would reach the zenith of its power and its ambitions. But the successes of Offa were built upon the foundation established by Athelbald, and seemingly Offa himself was aware of this. It was during his reign that an elaborate stone cross was erected at Repton, where Athelbald was buried. On the fragment of this cross to survive today, we can see a figure clad in armour and wielding a shield riding a horse. A long moustache is all that remains of what must have once been a stern face, and on top of his head we can see the thin line of a diadem. This diadem, which would briefly become a symbol of preeminent royal power under offer, marks the figure out as a king, and it is usually interpreted as a depiction of Athelbald in full war gear, commissioned under the kingship of his cousin. The Repton Cross tells us that Athelbald's memory as a strong leader, remained potent even after his murder. But it also clashes somewhat with the image of him that we get from the primary evidence. As I said, he did win his fair share of wars, but he was not really a warlord in the way of his predecessors. The parts of his reign that stand out the most now cast him instead as a shrewd statesman who understood the importance of loyalty and power structures. Really, Athelbald's reign is quite frustrating to study as a historian, because it just makes us wish that there was more written evidence, specifically written evidence produced from within Mercia, since the kingdom must have been undergoing some quite momentous changes under Athelbald. And yet, the evidence of charters and the archaeological evidence that survives 
only really hint at those changes, rather than expressing their full significance and radicalism. But Athelbald's reign was only the beginning of broader changes within the Mercian kingdom. Far more momentous changes were to come under the leadership of Offa, who would become to later generations easily the defining Mercian king. Thank you for listening. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Anglo-Saxon England podcast. Once again, if you have, I'd like to ask that you like, subscribe, comment, follow, whatever it is you do on whatever platform you prefer. And if you're able to, please support our Patreon. Anything helps. But that's all for now. Thank you for listening. I've been your host, Tom Kearns, and this has been the Anglo-Saxon England podcast.